coach and make the decisions he wanted to make. Um, obviously, we'll never know to what extent he was, you know, in the right and what extent he was just having his nose put out of joint or whatever else it might have been. But there's clearly stuff behind the scenes there, isn't there? And I suspect that maybe ripping the plaster off that, you know, whether he had protected the or or what it was, but I suspect that that's what actually has caused the downturn in their form. Yeah, yeah, something something fractured along the way there. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I, I certainly see the point that you're making. Um, it's it's a big job for Danny Maguire to uh, turn things around from. It'll be a big test of him. They, they've kind of hidden within all this. It was announced that he's going to be sticking around as assistant coach to Willie Peters. So obviously he's seen as a long-term part of the club still. So um, so that might give them more stability and that sort of stuff and better opportunity to have conversations with players about next year and those sorts of things as well, um, which might help sort some things out if people know what direction they're all pulling in. It might might help things out. So um so yeah, but Tony Smith's legacy at Hull KR will be remembered by he got he was part of them, you know, coming back to Super League and stuff, but the part of it really he, he was they were eleventh. They were bottom in twenty twenty when they kinda of saw it as a free season to not really care yeah and be a bit carefree i suppose in the way they were playing things and they were entertaining even though they were losing every week then last year that entertainment carried over but they were winning half of the time as well which was really good and then the playoff win over warrington will will be his main legacy i hope in the whole kr fans eyes rather than the the last sort of two months where it's been pretty miserable for him and he got them to a semi-final didn't he of the Challenge cup this year just before yeah. he announced his leaving and i genuinely thought that they would beat huddersfield i thought that they would be in the final um yeah yeah yep well any, anyway we'll find out what's next for tony smith i'm sure in the not too distant future um couple more games to go through from Sunday. Wigan played Wakefield at the Bellevue Be Well Stadium, is it called now? Anyway, it was 28 points to 12 to Wigan at half time. They finished 46 22 winners over their host. 7,046 was a decent crowd to say farewell to the older uh, seated stand at, at Bellevue. I think now's when they're going to start knocking it down. Chris Kendall was the referee. Wigan made nearly 200 more metres, a big 2.1 metres per carry better average gain, conceded fewer penalties and had a better team tackle success rate. They also made 10 breaks to four for eight tries to four. What about the individual numbers? Yep, so for Wigan, it was Abbas Miski with two tries and 118 metres and two clean breaks. Bevan's French with two tries, three tackles try assists on 100 metres and Liam Byrne with 100 metres and for the losing Wakefield it was Mason Lino with three try assists yeah Calipers sorry I was going to say I keep trying to call it tackle assists (laughs) um Callum Percy 99 said, easy win for Wigan in the end who didn't really come out of second gear. Thought Bevan was great and Byrne had a great game. Great attendance at the game with just short of 2k Wigan fans. Shows what cheap tickets and a weekend fixture can do. And Matt Speakman said, put 86 points on in two games and won easily both times and yet I'm left thinking it could have been more. Yes, there were defensive lapses and poor reads to let them in, but Wakefield actually attacked quite well when they got down the right end with penalties and six against. Just had a turn style defence. Great to see so many Wigan fans there. I know I've been to most away games since I was a kid and they were and they were free. Oh, yes. when I was a kid they were free. Yeah. I, I, you know, I didn't know what the ticket if there was cheap tickets or anything for this one. I, I already had other plans so I knew from a month out or so that I wasn't going to be going to this game but I have watched it since and there actually looked to be quite a lot of Wakefield fans there as well. It, it, you know, it, it looked more full it looked like that 7,000 figure, which is, um, you know, a nice way for, for Wakefield to say goodbye to part of the stadium as their rebuild starts, I suppose. Yeah. In terms of the game, 
Wigan started the game really well. Uh, Harry Smith kicked a 40 20. They. I think it was six minutes before Wakefield even touched the ball, other than the kickoffs. Um, Wigan scored three tries down the left edge, all different tries, all different try scorers, and Wakefield barely touched the ball. But So, excellent 50 minutes. Then Wigan had a bit of a wobble for 10 minutes. They invited pressure on with some penalties. Wakefield executed. Um, Jowett and Lino being the key architects of that. Um, but then, another excellent 15 minutes for Wigan leading up to half time which included the Bevan French try that's in the try of the week um, options on, on our league I've written down here a really good hot stepping try out of nothing for Bevan French um, French was excellent again at, at full back I mean Fields doing decent at standoff as well better than French would be doing at standoff so that's why it's the right call to play it how they've played it uh, Smith he showed his hard to drop as well when Cust or Tommy are both back fit and available. So, um, so that's really good for Wigan. Um, you notice there, Mason Lino got a Grade A disputes decision, no match penalty notice because he's not been in trouble too much, I think. But um, that he also got sin binned for descent. So that was the same incident just before half time. There was a ball steal on Wakefield's own line, and he took exception to it. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so that's that's the negative for him. The positive was he was a threat when Wigan did gift Wakefield field position and some possession. Um, he, he was creative in, in those instances. So good and bad from Lino for Wakefield. Um, I think it was whilst Lino was still off or just as he was coming back on, maybe Wigan scored the opening try of the second half, took it out to... Um, 30 odd points to 12 and I think Wigan at that point thought they'd won and just started throwing crazy loose offloads all the time leading to errors really low set completion and it meant Wigan really left a few scores out on the field that you know in the during the game Wigan had three scores called back for forward passes uh, I think a couple were in the first half as well but um, and I think two of those to be honest were quite close calls most likely the correct calls but no more forward than say Lomax's pass to Makinson for for Makinson's try that we talked about earlier, um, but there I was one that was obviously for Wakefield because there were a lot of uh, tries pulled back for forward passes in our game um, there the other week. The ref, the refs, the officials must have good viewing lines maybe at that stadium to to, yeah. to spot them because um, I'm not saying they weren't correct calls. I'm just saying Wigan left points out there. Yeah, no, no, no. That was, yeah, that was my point. I just wonder if there's yeah something about like you said. Yeah. One of the forward passes was actually an offload, not a pass. But Wigan, if they'd have gone out the back, had like three on one. But yeah, they went to the front runner, and um, and then the offload was forward, so wasn't a score. I think what I would say to sum it up is comprehensive win for Wigan, but not faultless. Um, yeah. And uh, I don't have a lot to say about Wakefield, if I'm honest, from from watching the game. And, you know, if you score 46 points and you can come away and say that, then that's a real positive, isn't it? It is, yeah. I mean, Wakefield need to sharpen up their defence for next week, um, a big game next week, a bigger game than this game, even if Willie Poaching is playing it down a little bit. It's just another game against Toulouse. Um it's uh, yeah, because their attack isn't the problem. They would they were sharp when Wigan gave them field position with our errors or our penalties. Yeah, just just getting up the other end of the field themselves was a problem, I suppose. Um, we talked about Mason Lino, haven't we? Uh, Wakefield have signed dual co winger Kyle Evans on a deal until the end of the season, following a successful trial period. The 30 year old spent three seasons in the Welsh Premiership with Flynn Effley, scoring 27 tries in 57 appearances. He's also played for Scarlets as well as Merthyr and Doncaster Knights, where he most recently was at. He scored on debut from a really nice kick from Mason Lino, found him in space. He took the ball and. Uh, ran in behind the sticks I think actually so good score from him there um, but sad news 
out of Wakefield tonight before we started recording. Wakefield Trinity Centre Bill Tupu has confirmed his retirement from the sport with immediate effect. The 32-year-old has made 126 appearances for the club, scoring 40 tries. He also made the Super League Dream Team in 2018. He suffered a season-ending injury last year with a ruptured patella tendon and hasn't featured in the first team since. He, he did make a comeback for the reserves, but had a further issue, further surgery to clean that up. And Tupu has taken the decision to retire following medical advice um he was yeah. he was one of the most dominant centers in super league for two or three years from sort of 2018 2019 period wasn't he yeah it's funny he's one of those players that you feel like he's been playing forever but at the same time in retiring feels very young yes yeah well didn't he play like once for the kiwis about like 12 years ago or something crazy like he's been around a long time had a lull before coming to Wakefield where he kind of dropped out of things NRL wise but has given really decent service apart from two significant injuries for Wakefield in the last six years or so yeah yeah no he's a he's yeah he was one of the players they brought in in the sort of battle for survival in one of the super eights years wasn't he I think the year yes. maybe that witness ended up going down, possibly. Yeah, yeah. No, he's a, he's been a really solid player and, you know, one actually that I think probably could have done a job at a lot of clubs. Hard to hate as well. Yeah. Well hard to hate, I'd say, Bill Tupu. <laughs> so he's another one for that category we discussed at the top of the show. But that's, you know, good luck to him in his post-playing life because... Um, Seemed like a decent, decent player, decent chap. Uh, okay, last game of the weekend, and there might be some laughter from some people on this one. It was Warrington twenty-four, Salford thirty-two. Uh, it was eight-six actually to hold Salford at, at half time, but that does not tell the full story. Eight thousand five hundred fifty-nine was the crowd. Robert Hicks was the referee. Salford edged the key attacking stats. Slightly more metres, slightly better average game. One more break. Although Wire made three fewer errors and conceded three fewer penalties. Um, they also had a worse team tackle success rate. What about individually? Yep, so individually it was Reese Williams with one try, six tackle busts and 139 metres. Jack Ormondroyd with two tries, 122 metres, two clean breaks. Tim Lafay with 115 metres and Brodie Croft with 113 metres. For the losing Warrington team, it was Joe Bullock with 156 metres, Mike Cooper with 102 metres and Jake Wardle with one try assist and 101 metres. We start with Callum Percy, who says, <laughs> Serves them right for singing Sulphur Get Battered Everywhere They Go When Wire Were Winning. <laughs> God, we're going to be fucking sick of that song next weekend. Yeah. Every team's going to be getting battered everywhere they go until they're not getting battered everywhere they go when their own fans will be singing We Get Battered Everywhere We Go, ironically, and it's going to be a perpetual cycle of that fucking song. (laughs) Right. Can I ask a question? When you sing it, is the swearing in the middle of it? Or is it just purely whoever get battered everywhere they go? It's whoever gets battered everywhere they go. Yeah, Joshua told me that there was bad language in the middle of it. All oh, right. And I didn't think there was. But, you know, he thinks he knows everything now. <laughs> well, that's referees for you. So arrogant. Yeah. yeah, what do they know? Ruining every match they referee. <laughs> um, coming up, Rose said, well, Warrington, they say money talks. Too bad in your case, it talks utter shite. <laughs> oh, good one. Um, EFC 78J, you said, that performance today was utter wolf shite as we kept on <laughs> letting <laughs> Salford... I know, I love that. Letting Salford through with easy tries, but we struck and got ourselves one, but we just blew the game away and gave it to the Mank Union Devils before going to Castleford. Let's brush off on the Catalan Dragons next game Sunday and another year of magic at Newcastle. If we start losing the serious fixtures, we might be back in it. Oh, he means back in the relegation battle. Yeah. Oh, right, yeah. It's a shame that we don't put swear words as episode titles because Utter Wolfshite would have been the episode title if we did. 
I didn't understand it for a minute, and then I did. <laughs> I thought that was just an EFC-ism. It's his best one yet. I liked it. Uh, Rich Owen said, started the game poorly and finished the game even worse. Losing the game in that fashion is a new learning.